the most Christ-centered epistle of them all. Now, this is class part two, or class two, part two. We're studying the second half of Colossians, and whether the application is discussed with the great preparation Lucian made for his class next week, that's uh, up to him and Ron to decide. But this is Colossians, text two, <laughs> part two. And Colossians is the most Christ-centered epistle, and for good reason. Uh, we discussed First and Second Corinthians, and unlike those epistles, oh, it only takes 13 minutes to read the text of Colossians, very brief. So the teaching time is minimal. But the main message is Jesus is all you need. And in your mind, next time you hear the song In Christ Alone, and the class of Colossians is fresh in your mind, it means more to you. Just like every verse in Colossians means more to you when you realize that, Jesus, that Paul is combating a heresy that says, oh, you might have Christ, but, but go to something else or add something else instead or in addition to. No, you've got all you need in Christ. You don't need anything else. And we are convinced. Some people would say we're closed-minded by those who haven't investigated Christ nor proven it with their own life testimony. But we are convinced by all that we've done that Jesus is the Christ. So convinced that while we might we might observe what others teach. We're not giving it heed one bit. We're not listening to anything else someone else says that comes to you and says, oh, we have something else other than Christ. No, you don't. You do not. Christ is all I need, and he's all that anyone and everyone needs. So with that being what Paul wants to get across, he does an expert job by just jumping in there with the text and doing this. There is one paragraph that I did not really share last week, but the points will be familiar. The Colossae heresy was not as pervasive as the problems in Corinth. It had not also overtaken the brethren like the false teachings had done in Galatia. Uh, we studied Galatians for three months last year, and we might remember that. So why address that problem in such a short epistle on inspired text? Precious space. It's because the nature of the heresy was so serious that it had to be addressed early on. Anything that comes to you with the core of it being a, of human origin, if you want to say human origin, okay, I'll give it that because it's not of God. Any doctrine that comes to you that's not of divine revelation, i.e. the Bible today, then if it says you need something other than Christ or something in addition to Christ, forget it. It's not of God. And that's why it was so serious about this. It was able to mislead some souls away from Christ. So Paul, while under house arrest, is writing this epistle to uh, stabilize the church regarding the nature and identity of the teachings of Christ. And that's how he does it, folks. That's how he does it, regarding the nature and the uh, teachings of Christ. John would say that there are two criteria for judging false doctrine. One, does this person say that we are following Christ? Is Christ alone all that we need? Well, that depends on two things. Is he God in flesh? And if you say that Jesus is God in flesh, you, you're past the first hoop. You're on stage level one. We have one more to go. If you say you have a teaching that is from Christ, but it counters something Jesus has taught, then it's not of Christ. You can say, you can borrow a name and say, oh, this is Jesus' teaching, but if it doesn't balance with the truth, then it makes no difference. So, uh, with all the techie stuff that we're doing, uh, we are looking now at the text. Turn with me to Colossians. What we're going to do is simply read the text like Paul instructed us to and get right up to the point of chapter 2, verse 11. Now, you might remember last time we had the structure of questions. Eh, we don't need to cover that again. But obviously, you don't need anything else. You've got Jesus. Chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 is where we will conclude, and that's the best, one of the best passages in all of Scripture. For in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him, you have been forgiven, or given fullness, yes, which is a blessing of Christ, is forgiveness, made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. How important it would it be for the Colossians to hear this if they were being told that something has more authority than Christ. Oh, listen to me, I've had special revelation or vision. No, you haven't. You can say you have all day long, but it's unverified and unverifiable. Christ is all you need. So I'll let all of chapter 1's questions <laughs> be on the screen so that you can be reminded on your own time what answers are coming straight from the text. Let's go together now reading chapter 1. 
Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and, fellow and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Grace to you and peace from our God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we, um, let's see, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of this, you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel. And he's focusing on the gospel. And due to my phone's settings, I'm actually going to go to the, not screenshot, but the text itself so I can scroll. I'll remember my notes. Okay. All right. Verse 7. Just as you heard, or just as you learned it from Epaphras, by the way, it's likely that Epaphras is the one, it's possible he could be reading this since he was carrying the letter back to him. He could have been assigned likely to read this to him. And it was very satisfying to no doubt read what Paul said of him. Our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Wow. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That would be important for them to hear. You have all you need to have proper understanding and wisdom in Christ, so as to walk in the manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience, with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. Only God has the power to do that. In whom we have redemption, forgiveness of sins. Now he deals with the preeminence of Christ. Here it is. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn or preeminent, uh, prominent of all creation. For by him all things were created, so that places him before creation, deity, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Verse 17. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. This will be a great compliment to our sermon today. For in him, verse 19, in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, once who, were, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil things, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. That's what could do it. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, don't shift from that gospel, don't do it, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. How does he view his ministry? Verse 24, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up, or yeah, completing what is lacking in Christ's affliction. For the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister, according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God more fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. You, you want to be excited about a mystery now known to you? Get excited about the gospel. This is God's plan all along. 
to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil. What's this? Presenting everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy he, that he powerfully works within me. Chapter 2. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts might be encouraged. He's praying hard, giving his best in prayer that they may be encouraged, knit together in love, to reach all the riches, the, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is the gospel of Christ. Verse 3, in whom are hidden all treasures and wisdom of knowledge. So why are you looking at something else? All treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Christ. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Don't be fooled with reasons that sound good instead of good sound reasons. Be guided by that. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as he's talking now to us about being alive in Christ, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Something to be thankful for indeed. And then verse 8 through 10. See to it that no one takes you captive. Notice the imagery. Takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, all, let's see, in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. And at that point, we have had teaching on those verses. And what we are going to do is shift that to today and go back to the question, text, comment uh, format. Question, text, comment. And what we have just done, just in verses 6 through 7, Paul has described the condition of the ideal congregation. I want you to imagine what Oak Hill would be like if you knew and if your experience every day, every time, and you just knew it always was definitive of every member. How would Oak Hill be if every member was categorized and uh, described, described, defined by these words? Courageous in the faith, confident, comforted. Every time you come, you came, you knew you would be comforted by their comfort that they've received from God. Encouraged, edified, built up, knowledgeable. They know what they're talking about. Loving, strong, considerate, united, and grateful with thanksgiving. This is, this is great, isn't it? That would be great. And you know what? It is great. It is great. We strive to become that all the time. But verses 8 through 10 that we just concluded with is based on the question, how did Paul refute the human philosophy challenging the Colossians? And he refuted it with the imagery of being taken captive. You're free. You have everything in the world that you could want, but now you're trapped again. That's not very appealing, is it? And he calls it, vain or empty, worthless. And it's evidenced by such things as showing its human origin, human tradition. And this phrase, according to the elemental spirits of the world, that might throw you off a little bit. So I almost gave you a definition based from maybe how Ephesians deals with terms that are very similar. But this is Coloss Colossians. So what would Paul's mind be thinking of, just in a, uh, in a simple way, with this term, the elemental spirits of the world. He's talking about the full nature of Christ and how we understand full wisdom from the, the discernment of spiritual truth revealed. So I just simply defined it as the foolish, uh, uh, let's see, foolishness and evil. Everything that is foolish and evil 
and its nature and from what it comes from as opposed to Christ. Simple as that. And there's the contrast. Opposed to Christ. Christ liberates everything else in slaves. So don't be swayed. Just don't be swayed by this heresy. We have another question now for verses 11 through 13. And the question is, picking up where we left off, since God's covenant with Jews has been fulfilled by the physical symbol of circumcision, okay? Since that covenant has been fulfilled and the circumcision was a symbol of that covenant for a time, and it has been fulfilled, which means it's no longer in effect, we can now look back through the uh, lens of the new covenant and see more clearly what has always been in the old covenant even then. That God, you know, what desired mercy, not sacrifice. He always cared about having the heart over the ritual. A lot of times the Israelites, would, the Jews, would worship uh, God on, on the Sabbath and then worship other gods on the other days of the week. What's up with that? God wanted them, their heart, the relationship with them. So the question is, how and when is the spiritual circumcision accomplished? We mentioned this so briefly last week that this was uh, the last point uh, that some of you had in your mind. And it was a good point. Think about this. We often extend the invitation, but we forget what all takes place. Verse 11, in him, in him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the power working of God. The powerful working of who? God. God, I'm going to come back to that. Who raised him from the dead? That same spirit that dwells in us. Wow. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiveness and having forgiven us all our trespasses. What is this beautiful passage telling us? Worded simply, Paul's very wordy here to clarify all the terms. And I would, it would take about five minutes to show you how he's clarifying this and clarifying that. You just break all that down, all those verses down to the bare core. What's he saying? God circumcised your heart when you obeyed the gospel in baptism. Isn't that incredible? We yield to the power of God when we choose in faith to obey. It's nothing that we do. It's obedience, but it's his power that is granted to us by our faith response. And God circumcised our hearts. I thought circumcision was a sign of the covenant that you're God's people. Yes, circumcision of the heart is now our sign that we are God's people. How did that happen? By our faith in Christ, manifested in baptism, God did his work, and I'm God's. I carry that in my spirit, that sign, that symbol that I'm his, and that he has purified me with the blessing of forgiveness. All these blessings that I have in Christ, and Paul is reminding them, you don't need to look anywhere else to something that would enslave you again. Verses 14 through 17. Three statements are given to express the abrogation of the law. We mentioned that it was now annulled, it abolished. What are the three statements? Let's go to the text. Verse 14, by canceling the record of debt, of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This, now anytime I'm writing or, or hearing someone else speak or speaking myself, uh, it's natural for me, or I should say conditioned for me, for those old English classes, to uh, make sure in my writing that any time I use the word this or that or it, that it has a clear antecedent. And in this case, what is this referring to? The consequences of the cancellation of the record, which is and which are guilt and the legal requirements. I, I, no guilt and sin. No fear of death. He set it aside, nailing it to the cross. His statement references a Roman custom next. Now, the Romans, well, let me reword this. His next statement would remind the culture of the day of what Romans were definitely used to doing. It would be still true to us, and it's still kind of true today with human nature, but Romans, whenever they conquered an enemy, they would celebrate their victory by also disgracing their enemy. And just think about that, and you've seen that in person, and your mind envisions seeing such a thing in person. And then to transfer that over to Christ being victorious, and I don't want to be the one mocked by being defeated, so I want to stay with the victor, the one who is uh, victorious. And, therefore, he, he 
continues, verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So the powers that killed Jesus were disgraced by his resurrection. That's what it's saying. The powers that killed Jesus were disgraced by his resurrection. And we rejoice in this. So we best not let anyone disqualify us. Don't let them steal that part of the glory you're participating in by your faith. Verse 16, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or of regard to a festival or a new moon or the Sabbath. Those are vestiges of the Jewish traditions, right, <laughs> which they elevated over God's law. It's amazing. If they'd have read the revealed prophecies, they would see it was all fulfilled, but they did not. It's really hard to change, I know, but wow. Verse 17, these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. I jumped to this illustration so quickly that now it might be more to us this time. Before Christ came, it was all appropriate to celebrate in the shadows of the things that were promised to come. Absolutely, because if you stay faithful, you'll have that blessing retrospectively of forgiveness with Christ on the cross, no doubt. But it's foolish now that Christ is here and has come to still rejoice in the shadows of anything. Think about this. When you walk to your vehicle, when you arrive at home, when you eat a meal, it would be ridiculous to only admire the shadow of your car, the shadow of your house, the shadow of the plate of food. None, the shadow can't take you home. The shadow won't protect you from the elements, and the shadow won't give your stomach nourishment. You've got the substance right there to give you blessing, and we have that in Christ. We admire the substance, Judaism, the old covenant, I should is no longer biting. And this heresy that's trying to tell you that something's more powerful and authoritative, uh-uh, it's not. So don't heed this heresy um, by, by uh, giving heed to this, uh, all the tenets that they, te that they teach. So Paul, point by point, knows very well what this heresy is by everything he says. In verses 18 and 19, there's another good question. How or by whom could the brethren be defrauded of their reward? Well, good answer. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels. I'll momentarily speak of the asceticism here. You know, emaciating the body, hurting it, is no way to purify the soul. We know that in the doctrine of Christ. But if you're not teaching Christ, it makes sense to think that God must be, you know, up in heaven there on that level so pure, but us as flesh, not so pure. In fact, if flesh is inherently sinful, if that's what they teach, then how do you get to God? by eventually uh, uh, pushing the flesh down. And, and therefore, at every 14 stages of, of your development back towards God that they, use, that they later taught, uh, you just have angels at different stages, and so it makes sense to worship them to go to the next level. But that, of course, is a heresy. It's not doctrinal truth. It's not gospel. And so uh, Paul says, come back to your righteous, righteous mind in verse 19. Uh, but he says, they're going on in details about visions and puffed up with, without reason of a sensual mind. He says in verse 19, Not holding fast to the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. So those in the body are connected to Christ, the head. So those body members are growing in Christ. If you're not connected to Christ, you're not growing. It, you're detached. And what happens when a body member is detached? It, it, it decays and putrefies. It's no longer living. It's not having the blood of Christ flow through it to keep it alive. So what does it say about us spiritually? We've got to stay connected to Christ if we want to grow in all spiritual wisdom. And that's what Paul is trying to get across. If you sever yourself from the head, no longer a part of the body, you will surely die. Don't do it. Verses 20 and 22 um, ask this answer this question to what regulations were the brethren subjecting themselves to okay oh it's so sad that they were doing this i mean even paul with how much he respected the jewish tradition he still knows how empty they are now does that make sense <laughs> they're they're valuable for what they meant but if you're doing them thinking that that's what your salvation is in they're meaningless if christ if with Christ you die to the elemental spirits of the world, which are the philosophies and practices of unrighteous carnality, I didn't say it as good last time, but the philosophies and practices of unrighteous carnality, anything that's sinful, not of Christ, 
if you die to that, then why? I'm, I'm thinking of Seinfeld's voice in my mind for some reason. Why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to the things that all perish as they are used according to the human precepts and teachings. Let me connect all that. He just says, then why are you submitting to human teachings? I don't know. It blows my mind sometimes if people aren't firmly rooted in Christ. But that's what we're doing today, reminding us how important that is. Thank you, Paul. Paul's core question is, why are you submitting to false teachings and empty human traditions when Christ has all authority and power? Now, that's a good question. How would that question be worded today? The different think points there. Why are you submitting to, and you insert whatever a person is turning away from, or turning away to? Blows my mind. Ah. Verse 23 answers a good question. How does Paul describe those things to which they were subjecting themselves? Ha, uh, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom. So he acknowledges it's very alluring. People are attracted to what think, they think sounds smarter when they're ignorant and don't know any better yet. An appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and uh, severity to the body. But they are of no value. That's how he describes it. No value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Again, punishing the physical body does not purify the soul. Now, if you want to follow that to a great degree, we also are reminded that Jesus taught certain things about making sure you make no provision for sin, but in the context of his teachings, which you may know, I'm just going to say if you're familiar with it and are with me today right now, you, you know it. Jesus has never taught asceticism, but he does say make provision against sin, and I think that's a good, safe approach. Purifying the soul is a job only for the great physician. And our part is actively yielding to those procedural powers. Think about going into surgery. Uh, what, what, what do you do during surgery? You volunteer yourself to go under his skilled hands. And he did it. You participated. You trusted. You had faith. And, and that's the key. But like baptism, we are obeying, yielding to his power, and only God can do this. And so what Paul is also saying is if you want to overcome temptation and become more pure in your thinking and in your spirit, you will get that if you stay in focusing Christ. Very important. Thing. I showed you this last week, and it's just a summary of many things, but I stated that throughout the ages there are thousands of false teachings that are still characterized by what the Colossae heresy was, was established by, and it's just not good. It's just not good. They, they're very seductive. They appear to be smarter. They focus on rituals and traditions, laws, and other things that take away from the sufficiency of Christ. Through those lenses, through the filter of Colossians, the epistle of Colossians, listen very carefully to anyone telling you anything that you don't study in the Bible. And it makes all the difference in the world. So regarding putting on the new self, we're up to chapter 3 now. We have 10 minutes. I told you this is the way it works. Uh, let's quick... Thankfully, chapter 4 is just a bunch of greetings. Like, and we can learn a lot from those. But chapter 3 is it, folks. It's pretty straightforward, and this is where Lucian would gather, no doubt, a lot of those practical applications. And so let's let the text speak. Question 4, verses 1 through 4. What exhortations are given to those who have been raised with Christ, and why? What is Paul telling you to do? Okay, I'm listening to the text. Speak to me, Lord. And what does he do? Speaks you through his word. Here is what God is telling me and you and I. If you have been raised with Christ, and I have, seek the things that are above. Focus on spiritual matters. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind. That's a command. Set your mind on things that are above, not things on the earth. Because you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Okay, if you want to be with Christ in heaven, stop focusing and living like the world. Decide to fixate your focus on spiritual matters. And in all of your responsibilities and accountable tasks of each day, do it unto the Lord. Focus on God in everything. 
verses 5 through 7, what members which are of the earth are to be put to death, and why? Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And here's a list that describes the world of today. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Well, that's the world that we live in. We're in the world, but not of the world. So put that all away. We're different. Verse 6, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Oh, that's a good reason to put, a, put them away, for sure. Yeah. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. We best not participate in what God says he will obliterate. I don't want, any, I don't want that wrath to work towards me. Oh, no. I don't want to fear judgment. So I'll look forward to his return. Verses 8 through 11, what negative traits of character are we to put off and what are we to put on? I'm thinking about our Wednesday night series, for example. Verse 8, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk. Verse 9, do not lie. You've put off that old self with its practices. Verse 10, and have put on the new self. So the new is different than the old. Okay, so everything just read, don't do that. What's new? Which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So we represent God and virtuous things. Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. So, he says, you feel like what you think you know separate from Christ makes you better than others? Get this. And this is what they would perceive through the filter of Colossae heresy. Paul is telling them, divine wisdom reveals that only in Christ there is holiness and unity among those who are equally saved. Now, think of all the truths in that statement that would counter a way of thinking that they were conditioned to think not quite right. Divine wisdom reveals that only in Christ there is holiness and unity among those who are equally saved. Wow. Whew. And if you're holding on to any of the old self, you won't want to buy into that. But godly wisdom produces godly living. Godly wisdom produces godly living. Verses 12 through 15. Additionally, what are we to put on? Put on then God as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, Humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, you must also forgive, and above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. He just described what is not like the world. In these heavenly virtues, we will have no increase if we do not daily invest. And I'm thankful that God is the judge for those who simply do not let their faith influence how they treat the saints and sinners. I know that's a bold statement, but for time, I won't repeat that one. Verse 16. What can we learn from singing about this passage? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. Well, from the text, we learn that songs are a great way to teach truth and correct error. I love a good sermon in a song. Every song is a sermon. And here's an interesting fact. The song, or I should say the Greek term for spiritual song, comes from a phrase that means ode to breathe, ode to breathe. There is a connection to this, and that implies a sense of spontaneity of expression. And if that's the case, do you know that when the heart dwells full on the word of Christ, the overflow is often a spontaneous expression in song? Do you whistle, or do you sing songs to yourself, uh, religious songs? Now, I'm going to say this. I try not to judge hearts as people are growing, but it is a sign of concern when Christians simply never express overflow of the heart in song. Think about that. It is a sign of concern when Christians never express overflow of the heart in song, especially when they teach truth and correct error. We need that. It doesn't matter how few or how many of us are in this auditorium. We can fill the airwaves with great song and praise to God. 
Verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. One hour a week religion is not Christ-centered living. Verses 18 through 19. What exhortations are given to wives and husbands? This, of course, is a sermon within itself. Um, wives, submit to your husbands as fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. We have some parallel passages in Ephesians, of course. But the divine relationship between Christ and his redeemed people should be mirrored in the loving treatment between spouses. I would love to spend more time on that because the husband's role, the wife's role are very important and they should see God's loving reverence, or I should say God's love for his saints and also the saints' loving reverence to follow him in how the husband and wife treat each other. Verses 20 and 21, what exhortations are given to the children and parents? Well, we as parents, we as uh, our parents' children are commanded to give due honor and obedience and maturing respect to our parents. Godly parents want their efforts also in rearing them to be deserving of that honor. So that's the distinction there. Chapter 3, the end of chapter 3 now, and the beginning of, verse, uh, beginning of chapter 4, verse 1. What exhortations are given to the servants and their masters? Well, this would make you think a lot. Bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by the way of the eye service, but as people pleasers, no, but instead with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. There is no partiality. Wow. But chapter 4, verse 1 would get you, especially if you were at that time a master and you had people in your household. Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Wow. You know, as Christians, treatment of others must always be in love, never compromised by social status. Slavery was a part of certainly that world's reality. Uh, it was just part of that world's reality. The command to treat one another with divine impartiality would eventually make all the difference in the world. That would be a good statement to keep in mind. Uh, verses 2 through 6, what exhortations does the lesson or epistle conclude? How does it conclude? Here's how. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open up a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, which is the gospel, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer each person. Perfect timing. So be grateful and pray. That's what Paul says. And pray for us. Pray for others to share the gospel, but not just for others. Pray for yourself as well to share the gospel. And then we have a lot of greetings. What was to be done with this epistle? What we've done today. Check this out, verse 16, briefly. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read basically everywhere else. We are supposed to read this epistle. Okay, I've just got to say this. You know, 5% um, of the people receiving an epistle like this in this area could actually read it. Uh, don't think too hard about that. But just imagine how culture's effect would influence their reverence toward the time it was being read. You wanted to hear what these apostles were saying. They didn't have a copy. They couldn't read it like we do. So let's make sure we hold that reverence. I had a statement. I'll just read it. I pray that you have such reverence for the word that your attention would hold if the whole service time was filled purely by the reading of the word. Because that's what Paul wanted us to do. And I hope it's been a blessing to